the last video I put out on Mars got me thinking about this Viking labeled release experiment that I had heard about a long time ago and forgot about and I forgot the name of after I remembered it again and so I it was actually in that other paper it was in uh, I think the conclusion section so it sparked my memory and I finally got some information to put out a video on this uh, so this is a paper that came out in 2012 going back and reanalyzing the data from that uh, Viking lander experiment so this was the actual experiment. They took a soil, a sample of the soil, and it went into these three kind of bins, or buckets, I guess you can call them, and then organic material was added to it, and any gases that came off would be proof that any microbes or bacteria or whatever in the soil is using the organic material, it's consuming it, and it's off-gassing. So they ran the experiment on the Viking lander, and it came back positive, which is to say that it passed the pre-flight criteria where if this was found, then yes, there's microbes in the soil. But it's not like NASA was just about to announce that to the world, that there's life on Mars, so they went back and came up with a bunch of re bunch of reasons why it might not be life, even though that's the criteria they had before they left. So let's let's go into the paper here. The only extraterrestrial life detection experiments ever conducted were the three which were components of the 1976 Viking mission to Mars. Of these, only the labeled release experiment obtained a clear positive response. In this experiment, C radio labeled nutrient was added to the Mars soil samples. Active soils exhibited rapid substantial gas release. The gas was probably CO2 and possibly other radiocarbon containing gases. And then he talks about what this study is and how they've gone and reanalyzed it. it says, we conclude that the complexity patterns seen in active experiments strongly suggest biology while the different pattern in control responses is more likely to be non-biological. Control responses that exhibit relatively low initial order rapid, rapidly devolve into near-random noise, while the active experiments exhibit high, higher initial order which decays only slowly. This suggests a robust biological response. These analyses support the interpretation that the Viking LR experiments did detect microbial life on Mars. Thus, for almost 35 years, a controversy has raged over whether or not Viking LR experiments detected life on Mars. Although the results of the LR experiment met the pre-launch criteria for the detection of, detection of life, the dominant explanation of the result was that a superoxide in the soil was responsible for oxidizing the organic molecules in the LR nutrient. Levin and Strat, who were the two that came up with the experiment in the first place, spent three years seeking a chemical or physical method to duplicate the Mars LR test and control data, to no avail. Moreover, Levin reviewed more than two dozen abiotic explanations that had been proposed over the years and found all of them wanting. Says, On the other hand, in recent years, biological interpretations of the LR experiment have become more acceptable with the discovery of equatorial methane generating regions on Mars, overlapping areas with extensive subsoil water ice deposits and atmospheric water vapor. And then it gives a link. I'm going to show you that link uh, coming up next. Furthermore, study of terrestrial extremophiles, including methane generating microbes in desert subsoil, indicate that such organisms can thrive in arid subsoil environments comparably harsh to the Martian environment. It has been proposed by Levin and Strat, and later by Miller et al., <clears throat> that both the persistence of methane in the Martian atmosphere and its re required sink can be explained by the possible presence of methane-producing and methane-consuming microorganisms similar to those on Earth. It is important to say that the nature of the LR gas or gases, and the degree to which the apparent circadian oscillations reflect CO2, what he's referring to there in the paper, um, it says that the gas was released and then released in a high quantity and then it would wane and then it would go back up and it would go back down. 
like a circadian rhythm that didn't match the day-night cycle. So not, not like it got hotter and released more gas and then got colder and released less gas. It was more like a biological rhythm. Uh, nevertheless, if the LR gas evolution and the active experiments were entirely non-biological, it would sort with the other purely physical rather than biological processes. In actuality, LR gas evolution and the active experiments sorted with the biological measures, while gas evolution controls, i.e. heat sterilization, sorted with non-biological measures. We believe that these results provide considerable support for the conclusion that the Viking LR experiments did indeed detect extant microbial life on them. So the main question to ask, NASA will of course deny this. But the question is, you've been back to Mars with how many landers and how many rovers, and you've never tried to repeat the experiment. You've never tried to, to update it and see what, actu what gas is actually being emitted. And if you, if you were at all concerned that you got a false positive the first time, you would go back and double check it. But instead, they came up with bogus explanations why it wasn't true and have swept it under the rug and have never gone back and tried the experiment again, which is all the proof that I need that they know that it passed the first time. And this is that link that was included in the paper before from ESA website. It's from September 2004. Recent analysis of ESA Mars Express data revealed the concentrations of water vapor, water vapor and methane in the atmosphere of Mars significantly overlap. This result from data obtained by the planetary Fourier spectrometer gives a boost to understanding of geological and atmospheric processes on Mars and provides important new hints to evaluate the hypothesis of present life on the red planet. And so this is that methane map that they're talking about. And it's essentially the same thing as the water vapor map. Like they said, they overlap, you know, almost, almost perfectly. So the equatorial region, or I guess where the oranges, yellows, and greens are, emits methane um, when it's hotter, you know, when the sun is giving more heat to the soil, I guess is that the microbes wake up and start, you know, biologically processing the soil, so to speak, and emit methane and water vapor. And again, it's seasonal and it's cyclical, and there's no natural explanation that's been given so far. So that article goes on. Um, the PFS observed that at 10 to 15 kilometers above the surface, water vapor is well mixed and uniform in the atmosphere. However, it found that close to the surface, water vapor is more concentrated in three broad equatorial regions, Arabia Terra, Elysium Planum, and Arcadia Memnonia. Here, the concentration is two to three times higher than in other regions observed. These areas of water vapor concentration also correspond to the areas where NASA's Odyssey spacecraft had observed water ice layer a few tens of centimeters below the surface, as Dr. Vittorio Formisano, PFS principal investigator, reported. New in-depth analysis of PFS data also confirms that methane is not uniform in the atmosphere, but concentrated in some areas. The PFS team observed that the areas of highest concentration of methane overlap with the areas where water vapor and underground water ice are also concentrated. This spatial correlation between water vapor and methane seems to point to a common underground source. Back here. 